No. And I believe Clyde Ellis was the man's name that presented it there. He's been here. I don't suppose he is. But I think it's Clyde. And they presented a documented evidentiary type of film that said we were going to run out of energy in 10 years. And I came back and told the staff there that either they were crazy or the rest of this country was crazy and they should be able to find out. I can't understand why that we can't develop a mass transit system and many other things and carpools, why it's going to take us so long when we could put a man on the moon and build so many battleships and airplanes in World War II. I can't understand all these things. Now, where does this pertain to agriculture? I'm telling you where it, where it pertains to agriculture and how it pertains to agriculture. The greatest threat to the American farmer today that's even as great as the price destruction that we're having is the great increase in interest rates. There's nobody, and it's not because I'm in real estate, I'm not even going to mention real estate. There's nobody that can continue to produce the present food production in this country and pay the existing interest rates that's varying anywhere from 12 to 15 percent. They can't stay in business. There's no businessman in this country in the small business field that can pay that type of interest on an inventory that the people aren't buying and not go bankrupt. There's nobody that can buy the automobiles and the tractors and the new implements are now being cut back instead of being sent from the factories out to the out to the various dealerships. And what's going to happen is, as has happened before in countries throughout the world, that if we have this high interest rate continued, it's going to be like Harry Truman once said, it will make the rich richer and the poor poorer. And it will divide the people in to the class of the rich and the peasants and it won't take very long to do it. And if you talk about inflation, how is anybody going to pay 25% more for fertilizer and pay 5 to 6% more for interest without having an increase in the price for their products and every other segment of the economy following the same pattern? And I can tell you what's happening as far as land is concerned. There's not hardly any farmers now that are buying land. It's either farmers that have sold farms in an area where the price is higher, or you've got professional people that want a tax deduction, or you've got just straight investors. And I know that just as soon, because I've heard some of them say it, that just as soon as it looks like the economy is giving some guidance and stability, some of the very people that are fighting foreign land investments are waiting to, for them to use their own money in this country to buy big land tracts. And I'm telling you that the farmers of this country better wake up, they better unite their production, and they better price their production, and they better be ready to fight themselves and join with other groups throughout this country to fight for equity and justice, or there won't be enough family-type farmers left in five years from now to even stir up a good fight. And that's the picture that you've got. And who can do something about it? The people that attend this convention. But you better have the courage to fight. And I can't help but mention this because 
I hope I can explain myself, and I'm not advocating it. Nor would I be a part of it. But I can't help but think when I see those people in Iran that have been demonstrating that if you get the people unemployed in this country and you get the small business people going out of business and you get the farmers being pushed off of this land, there's enough animosity against the Rockefellers in this country that that kind of demonstration would be held around Chase Manhattan Bank in New York City. Now, to be sure that I clarify it so nobody says I'm advocating it. And the next step is going to be the same type of people parading around farmers that own the good-sized track of farms that they put together in three or four generations. We couldn't have planned the destruction of this country better, starting with agriculture, if we'd have pulled the best brains together and said, this is the way we're going to destroy it. We couldn't be doing it faster than it's happening. And the farmers of this nation had better wake up to the fact that they've got to unite their strength and take the lead, as many agrarian people have done in the past history of this country and other countries in the world, to help lead to the survival of this country as a free and independent democracy and make it, again, a dominant power, not for abuse of power, but for the good of power and the preservation of all free-thinking and democratic people throughout this world. And so it's all interwoven before, now, from now on. It's not just a simple agricultural problem. But we must not lean on that crutch and say, no, it's not just a simple agricultural problem. And say, so we can't do anything about it because it's something else. The farmers of this nation had better take the lead, folks. Because I don't think labor at this time is going to take the lead. I don't think that businesses organize small businesses to take the lead. And if somebody doesn't take the lead, we're all going to get run over by the big business investments in this country. And all that we've worked for as individuals and the family heritage that we all have and ours is the fourth generation, born in the house that we live in. The fourth generation there. And you know, we can leave them nothing if we don't protect that heritage. They can't do it. And it's our responsibility and I don't believe that I've overstated what the situation is now. And we're talking now about what's happening in Iran. You know? Same thing applied to what only a great, big, a much greater degree in Wisconsin if the National Guard had been called out and I can speak free now, I don't care whether any politician never did anyway, you know, whether they like me or not. And I don't care. But you know what? When they brought the show on this country, any political science student or any sociologist would have said that whether Khomeini's great or small or big or bad or dumb or, or a revolutionary or whatever he may be, the worst he could be. When there's been a revolution like that, 
against the Shaw and secondly against us, but about the saint, to bring him in. This time in history was like saying to the revolutionaries, they're challenging us, and Khomeini either had to make a move or there'd been some radicals that would have taken him over. These are results of mistakes over a long time, folks. And I don't know who can do it, but I think that the people of this country have got to analyze closer than they've ever analyzed before what is happening and do something about it. Because it's our homes, it's our future, but more importantly, the generations that we must preserve the future for, that we had better be thinking about. And I can tell you the first step that you can take is to go home and unite the production and put it through the NFO Nationwide Collection Dispatch and Delivery System. And everything mounted together and built together will have that much more pressure for an upward price movement. And if we don't get us farmers where we can do something about it, we've had an effect. All I say to you is, I appreciate the nice words that have been said. Some of them, you know, are questionable as we went along. <laughs> I don't know the full intent of them, you know. But I've enjoyed being here. But I do not believe that I should ever have an award as an individual, nor do I, will I accept one ever. Oh, now, when you want to, maybe 20 years from now, and, and you're not going to put me in the has-been class, I'm not by a long shot. I'm feeling too great. I'm not going to try in any way to be in the public life, I can tell you that. And don't worry. I'm going to support the NFO people, whatever the decisions are made, because we're right and I'm proud of being a, been a part of it. But there's no danger of me ever accepting an elected position again. I can assure you that, too. I've been the route. I have no regrets. I am proud of what we accomplished together. And if you ever want to get in and fight, I'll help you out, too. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to elect me to something. I want to help when I want to help, you know, not because I have to do it. I'm enjoying it, but I do mean it. You are a part of me. I did the best I could, and sometimes I wished I could have done better, you know. But I didn't know what else to do. But there's never been an organization in this country The most disappointing about it was that too many of the farmers wouldn't even pay their dues of 25 to $75 a year. Forget it. Don't go back and bemean them about it. It's no use. That's water over the dam. But you know, something like $50 million went down the drain that way. Probably the figure is never given. I don't think it hurts anything to say that, to just wake people up to the fact that farmers of the NFO carried the load for all of American agriculture in waging the fight for 25 years. Don't go home and pour salt in the wound and say that, but go home with pride that you did it and the pride that you know it wouldn't have been done if you hadn't have been a part of it and tell the people the structure, the system's there, and we need their help. And let's go home and do it. Thank you for your time. God bless you, and I'm glad to be here.
Well, I don't know how we're going to handle this next item. Minnesota has something that they would like to say to Mr. Staley. So if you folks will hold on for just a minute. I've heard from Minnesota many times. <laughs> <laughs> well, Warren Gast has asked to have a few minutes here. So while he's coming up here, I want to tell you one little item. Ruth Staley was the family farmer while Lauren Lee was not there, you know. And there are two little items that the ladies here will appreciate that came to mind as we were talking. One day I was down in the grain department. I used to uh, work in the news department of the organization there. And while I was down trying to shake the fellas down for some information and some news that we could use, I heard one of the fellas that were bargaining for grain saying, Will you call Ruth Staley and tell her where to deliver her soybeans? <laughs> he didn't say Orrin Lees, he said Ruth's. And then shortly thereafter, Orrin Lee had made a heck of a good deal on some cows with calves. <laughs> Got them down in southern Missouri someplace and brought them all home for Ruth to take care of that They winter. were really from Arkansas. We thought they were southern Missouri. <laughs> So I was in the feeder department one day with the same kind of mission, trying to get some news from those fellas. And Orrin Lee stopped by, and Mankey says, Staley, I know where you can get some more cows. They're really a good buy. Staley says, no, 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 Ruth said I can't bring another one home. <laughs> Here I am. OK, Warren. Well, greetings from the great state of Minnesota. And uh, I really mean that because uh, two of the people up here tonight are from Minnesota. I, I remember when Doris first became an NFO, and uh, she was that real active person down in our 7th district. And, uh, well, I mean, she did make things move. And, of course, Oris Kinerva, he's from Minnesota. And uh, one of the first things I remember about Oris was at a holding action, I believe, when he uh, held him in Monoman. Is that right, Oris? And uh, I remember when he introduced another Minnesota, Brunoff Gran, uh, who is, our, uh, who is uh, in the organization now at Corning here. And he introduced him as the up-and-coming young uh, leader in NFO. And then, of course, uh, today we have as our national vice president, Bob Arndt. So we in uh, Minnesota, we, we feel we've got something to be proud of. Um, you know, they say that we shouldn't live in the past. And I'll agree, but um, uh, we can think about the past. And uh, I think as far as NFO is concerned, we've always thought in the future. Because even way back in 62, we, in, in Minnesota, we weren't around quite in 58 yet, but, uh, or 56. But in 62, when I become a member, it was at that time that we started looking forward and, uh, that I know about. And ever since, NFO has always looked to tomorrow. We've never looked backwards because it's tomorrow that we're going to get a cost of production plus a profit. And uh, this is, uh, I think, probably one of the greatest attributes to Mr. Staley and the leadership that we've had all these years is that they have never let us forget or get us off of this track of collective bargaining. I understand and I am sure there would have been many easy ways to go the other way. But we can be thankful for, to Mr. Staley and, and the group to keep us on this uh, track of collective bargaining. I would just like to mention three things that I have come into my mind uh, that I think has been uh, real big things in NFO. And one was this meeting for action when we had over 36,000 people in Des Moines. And I know down in northern Minnesota, we left combine sit. And, and people laughed at us for many years for doing this. But this is the way it was. And then the milk holding action, which has been mentioned tonight several times, but to me, to, as a dairy farmer, and I know everybody else, to, to, to dump your, what we'd call our pride and our sweat and blood down the drain, it took men to do that. And I know we had uh, grain farmers in our county that envied us for doing it. Uh, there were some that even went out and bought bulk tanks of milk from non-members and had them dump it. And, and another one, of course, is this here uh, Des Moines deal where we raised about $6,000. And 
I can only attribute this to Mr. Staley and his leadership and uh, his uh, stability that we were able to do this. And uh, looking back at it, it was fun. These things were fun because we could stand shoulder to shoulder with our neighbor and, and the leadership in this organization, like Mr. Staley said, it was the whole bunch and, and it's been a great experience. So at this time, Mr. Staley, uh, from Minnesota, we have something to present you and I'd like to read it, if I can, without my glasses. In appreciation to Orrin Lee Staley for his many years of service on behalf of collective bargaining for agriculture from Minnesota National Farmers Organization. Thank you. I want to say thank you very much. And I'd like to tell you, I didn't have any more courage than anybody else. I could get just as scared as anybody could, I suppose. But I never did. And I remember when I came into talking about Wisconsin tonight, but anyway, the National Guard follow up on the other. When I flew into, into Madison, uh, how about you, uh, Wisconsin people? You remember that? You all were there in great numbers, and you had everybody scared to death, and they couldn't understand how I calmed you all down so much. As we were going up the steps of the Capitol building, the police uh, chief officer there said, I don't see how you, how you handle those farmers. I said, all they need to do is to be able to understand what's happening. I tell you the courage I had was because of that I believed in the strength of the people. And I believe that if you knew what had to be done, there was no other way to go, folks. Because if you couldn't do it, we couldn't do it, you know. And so there was one, only one way to do it. And I had the great belief in you and trust in you that I wasn't scared of any battle or anything or any pressure at any time. Because I knew that if you were told the truth and you had the facts, you had the strength that you would put behind whatever is necessary to protect the organization. And for that, I want to say thank you very much. I appreciate it. But together, we did it. Well, ladies, I think we've had a pretty satisfying meeting this evening. I hope you've enjoyed it. I'm glad you brought your guests along. <laughs> I have one little thing I'd like to share with you. And if they come through St. Joe, Missouri, <laughs> we're only two blocks west of the Ramada Inn. No ads, no ads. <laughs> I have here some handwritten notes that if any of you had notes from Butch Swaim, you know what his scribbly handwriting looks like. Martha ran across these notes in Butch's desk not too long ago and gave me copies of them. And I think that he has something to say to us even after the three or four years that he's been gone. I would like to just read a couple of things. If there was one item that Butch was known for. It was his enthusiasm. And I think this organization has done the great things we've done because of enthusiasm of individuals, everyone, not just Butch, but he was a good example for us. And so I would like to just offer two thoughts as we close here, and that is the renewal of enthusiasm for what it is we're doing. Why NFO was started? What was it good for? If somebody else was doing it, was it needed? Go back to square one just for a few minutes and think about the enthusiasm we had for the great idea that was to be ours first. And Butch had made these notes. He says, I prefer the folly of enthusiasm to the indifference of wisdom. The proper function of man is to live, not exist. Enthusiasm makes the difference. Then on another page he says, 
None are so old as those who have outlived enthusiasm. And one more thought on the last page says, keeping the mind free of darkness is a day-to-day -day job. I would like to say that enthusiasm should be our hallmark and what we go home with from this convention. For those who are not here, we have to be able to take back what it is that we have learned and try to share it. And the past 25 years have been a day in the lives of all of us. And this is a little note that I picked up in a sad situation a week or so ago. One of our good members, a young, talented daughter who was only 24 years old, was killed in a car wreck. She had lots to give. She was working with some underprivileged and troubled girls. And this was the little note that the minister chose. She was as active in that church, uh, well, she was 24 years old, and prior to that time, she had already been an elder in that church. She was that active with the younger people. This was the passage that he chose. And I think we can apply it in a happier circumstance if we think of the next 25 years as a new day. And each year, each decade starts with one day at a time. So I would like to close with this thought. This is the beginning of a new day. God has given me this day to use as I will. I can waste it or grow in its light and be of service to others. But what I do with this day is important because I have exchanged a day of my life for it. When tomorrow comes, today will be gone forever. I hope I will not regret the price I paid for it. So missionaries, let's go home. After you've had the full convention and remember what we're saying here as a member of the PEP team, you know, NFO, let's go. Thanks for coming. And ladies, please keep in mind we're going to have workshops on Wednesday at 10 in the morning and 2 in the afternoon for women activity coordinators and publicity chairman. Uh, hey, Norris, I'm in uh, suite 1035 if anybody wants to come by here. and visit. You tell them. I'm in